Well, hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me in the crowded YouTube world of orchid videos. Mine are but the ramblings of an amateur where I try to grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne without the help of grow lights, humidifiers, greenhouses, just me and them inside or outside or not at all really. So if that sounds like your bag, do hit subscribe. I post every week on a Friday and some of my ramblings might well help you in your orchid journey. And that journey, plant lovers, brings us to the front door of this little beauty. Look at that. What a fabulous paphiopedalum that is. Beautiful white and green flower. So let us today have a look at this orchid, look at where it comes from and its basic care. Now it's a paphiopedalum obviously, and just look at those leaves. So the first thing to say about this type of paphiopedalum with those mottled leaves is they make amazing houseplants even when they're not in bloom because the leaves are sensational. Other thing is I've made a couple of collaborative slipper orchid videos and my own repotting videos about my paphiopedalum. So I will link all those below. They're actually in one playlist for your ease of watching. This one, is the first time that I have got this to bloom for myself. So this is why we're gonna make this video, plant lovers. So without further ado, here we are. This is the plant now, as you can see, no tag. And I actually bought this from the wonderful Michael Coker, who I made two videos with, one about growing Phragmopediums and the other about deflasking. I'll link both of those. He uh, sometimes has private sales and sometimes sells at the Orchid Species Society of Victoria's um, biannual plant sale. So I bought this from him and there's no tag. Now, it probably is a type of hybrid paphiopedalum called Mordii, which was developed in about 1900 and it's a primary cross between two species, which are Paphiopedalum callosum and Paphiopedalum laurentianum. Uh, so they were brought together in beautiful harmony in about 1900. So Paphiopedalum laurentianum and Callosum were two quite early uh, named paphiopedalums. So they were the, some of the first brought into cultivation and therefore kind of obvious that they should have been the first to have been hybridized to produce this baby. Now, there are lots of different color variations of Mordier types and each one will have a variety name. So this one is unnamed, but nonetheless, the sort of the green and the white is pretty classic of that type. So Mordii types, Mordii, was created by a chap called Joseph Charlesworth in Britain. So he was a wealthy wool merchant and grew orchids as a hobby. And he was in fact the first British grower to use the modern techniques of basically flasking, where you put the seeds in a sterile solution to enable the seedlings to germinate. So he developed an incredible nursery, which went on for years and years and years in Britain, and was then sold and bought over by McBeans, which is still in operation. So there's a continuation all the way from Joseph Charlesworth to the present day in Britain, if you happen to be there. Now I couldn't find any reference to a Maud. So generally names like Maudier will be named after someone called Maud with the Latin suffix at the end. So you get lots of names in the orchid world. Uh, I'm just trying to think now actually. Well, Victoria Regine, for example, Queen Victoria. Um, but Joseph Charlesworth its name was given to quite a few different plants actually. So Charles Worthii is the name that you find. Anyway, he created this, decided to call it Paphiopedalum Mordii. So I imagine there was a Maud in his life who he decided to name this orchid after. And the name Maud was very fashionable at that sort of turn of the 19th, beginning of the 20th centuries. So Mordii it is. And once again, knowing the species ancestors of one of your plants can really help in you figuring out how to grow it. But I think a good rule of thumb, most hybridized plants are hybridized so that they are more vigorous, flower better or have better foliage. So they tend to be a little easier, whether it's an orchid or a pelagonium, whatever it might be. So hybridization brings its advantages in terms of care, which will get to plant lovers. But the two ancestor types of this, the first one, Paphiopedalum laurentianum. Now that is a hot grower, fairly lowish altitudes in Borneo. And that can be found in the crevices of limestone cliffs. So it's kind of a terrestrial growing in nooks, but often near rock. So it's kind of a terrestrial lithophyte megamix, which is quite a common story actually with lots of species paths. 
Now, the other ancestor, Paphiopedalum callosum, that is a higher altitude plant, which means, yes, it can take cooler temperatures. And that grows in the sort of Southeast Asian peninsula. So um, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, I think down into Malaysia as well. So quite a wide distribution, but a little higher, a little mountainous. So you've got those two combinations, a hot grower and a cool altitude grower kind of gives you a plant which just likes the same kind of conditions as you do. Which just goes to show, once again, makes a great house plant. So the Mordier types are really easy. Now, I've really not given this any special care, really. And look, ta-da, there it is. And just another point about Colossum's growing habits, that too can grow in mossy areas around rocks and nooks of rocks. So quite similar conditions, just higher altitude and different geographic location. So there you go terrestrials, lithophytes, basically growing at the ground level in and around rocks. So their roots are going into all that material that may have collected. And as it's a ground plant, it's an understory plant, not a lover of huge amounts of bright light. And generally with these mottled leaved types of paphiopedalums, they do want more shade than the more glossy leaved types that you can get. And phragmopediums, which have very glossy leaves, they can take more sun. So saying though, although these mottled leaves do suggest it can take lower light, my experience has been brighter light, but not strong and direct, does encourage better flowering. So mine is sitting on a north facing tabletop. Now I'm in the Southern hemisphere, so north is where all the light comes from. If you're in the Northern hemisphere, that would be the south facing part of the room, but it's quite a bit in and it gets quite bright indirect light in winter and actually less more ambient light in summer because the sun's higher. And it does get a little bit chilly because it's it's at the bottom of the stairs. So I'm not freezing obviously because it's a house, but um, it does get a little bit cold in winter. So it can get down to sort of 12-ish degrees centigrade. And it is just loving life there. So it's getting bright-ish indirect light, coolish nighttime temperatures, particularly in winter, but then beautifully warm ambient temperatures for the rest of the day. So basically the type of temperatures you like, which makes this the perfect plant to grow indoors all year, which I do. So watering wise, this one, so with paphiopedalums, kind of interesting, they don't want to be wringing wet, but you don't want them to dry out. You've got to find that happy medium. But this one does actually take a little bit more water. And I often do find that the saucer is still damp. And every time I find that, I think, oh, I'm going to rot the roots. It's going to end in tears. But no, this one does like a little bit more water. So I'd let it dry-ish between waterings. Um, don't keep it wringing wet all the time, but don't worry too much if there is a bit of moisture still in the saucer. It does like it, as long, of course, as your medium is free draining. But you know, you can kind of use anything. So although it's a terrestrial, I wouldn't be putting it in potting mix per se. I would still use a light orchid mix, whatever's right for you, wherever you are. So this one is still as Michael potted it, which is medium bark with, he uses these little terracotta balls like that, which obviously aerate the mixture. And because they're sort of rough, they do trap or enable moisture to be trapped in it. Also, it just lightens the mix. But you could use a medium bark with sphagnum, you could use sphagnum, you could use whatever is working for you. Your general orchid mix is gonna work well for this. The other thing too that I have been doing of late is occasionally giving it a little bit of diluted lime, garden lime in the watering. So this, both the ancestor species come from those sort of rocky areas. So a little bit of lime in the water does, according to Michael Coco, who I made the Phragmopedium video about, that is a, it's a great trick to use for lithophytic orchids. So not all the time, but a little bit of lime just helps the pH level of the soil. And then feeding wise, again, really not much for muchness, a light application of slow release fertilizer in spring on the top. When I repot it, I also put some in the mix and then a liquid feed, maybe once every three or four watering. So that will depend on the season and I don't feed it during the winter generally. But as you can see, this bud has emerged. It's now late winter here in Australia. So this bud emerged a month or so ago, so in midwinter. So as it is flowering, you could give it a tonic, which is sort of not a fertilizer per se, but something like a seaweed based solution or something from a worm farm even. Dilute to sort of one eighth, one tenth of the recommended dose. And you can do those sorts of treatments throughout winter and then ramp up your feeding again in the warmer weather. So I'm very thrilled about the flower. Very, very, look at that. It's just like a classic orchid. I mean, it's such a silly thing to say, but you know, one of my 
Maybe one of my triggers for collecting orchids is a scene in Keira Knightley's Pride and Prejudice, which I will say is the best version ever. And she is going into her father's study, played by Donald Sutherland, and he is pottering about with potted Paphiopedlums, which of course he couldn't have been doing in the late 18th, early 19th century when Pride and Prejudice was set because they hadn't really entered into cultivation in Britain. But we'll forgive that. The fact was he was in this beautiful study with a terracotta pot and a path in, a, in his hand. And I just thought, oh, wouldn't I love that life? Well, I've got the orchid. It's in a plastic pot at the moment actually kind of have the library. <laughs> so maybe I am Donald Sutherland or Mr. Bennett. So the flowers are just gorgeous on paphiopedlums or slipper orchids as they are commonly called. Now they will last a long time too, months. This one just blooms once. Now I do have a path that is a sequential bloomer so it blooms maybe five or six times from the stem which can last six, six months. Uh, then it takes two years to ramp up the energy to come back into bloom again and it's almost there I think. But this is the type of path that will just have one bloom from the stem. And what you can see is you have this thing called the fan. So this is last year's new growth and that is the one that produces the flower for you. What you can see there is the year before's fan and that little brown stick is where the flower was on the plant last year. And the great news is if we turn around baby, right round baby, what you can see just there is next year's new fan growing. So that will mature in a year and then that will produce the next flowering. By the way, I must apologize, my fingernails are filthy because I've just been in the garden, I just noticed. Oh, Matthew, dirty fingernails. Anyway, my mother would not be impressed. So the name of the game with these, as with many other orchids, is to encourage this vegetative growth, which is gonna give you your next blooms. Now, there isn't a grand secret to that is quite simply giving the orchid the conditions it wants and it's going to produce that new growth for you. And if you're lucky, you might get two, which means you can have the chance of getting multiple flower heads. So as the plant kind of matures, you might start getting multiple growths. Anyway, one flower is pretty beautiful. Now the flowers always have this sort of classic lip here, hence the slipper acronym and they can look a bit carnivorous but they're not but they are actually using this to trap the pollinating insect but not to devour it it sort of buzzes and flaps about in its anguish to get out and climbs up through the hairs at the back of the lip where it affects pollination so it's quite a, a cunning little honey trap I suppose. <laughs> Isn't that flower just stunning so look these fabulous petals and sepals and look at this with the amazing sort of stripes of green on the white background these amazing sort of whiskers and then the fabulously shaped pouch there. Such a stunning flower. Generally that's the form that all Paphiopedilums, Fragmopediums, Cypripediums are going to take that sort of form. It's interesting in those three different areas. So Paphiopedilums are Asiatic, Fragmopediums from South America and Cypripediums from North America and Europe I think. Um, and they've all evolved separately to have the same solution for pollination. Now, good idea to pot, repot these quite regularly. Now, once this flower dies, and by that point we'll be in spring, I will repot this and I will use basically the same size pot. Although you have to see what the root system's like. And they have an odd root system. They're sort of not very rooty, but they're quite thick and hairy roots. So you just wanna try and get a pot, the smallest pot you can that will fit those roots, sort of twist it in. I've made a repotting video, which I'm, I think, I'm sure I have. Anyway, I'll link that. So I will probably keep it in a pot that's the same size. It will be terracotta and I'll use a similar mix that Michael used. So medium bark with a little bit of perlite maybe. Uh, sometimes I use a little bit of out of the bag orchid mix as well because that's a little bit grittier. And then I reuse these little terracotta balls because they are fantastic as a filler for orchid mix. And um, no fragrance, I'm not sure. Maybe there is, maybe there are fragrant paphiopedilums, but I've never heard of one. Anyway, I am very excited I got this to rebloom. And that's kind of my raison d'etre for making videos, particularly with new orchids, is getting them to bloom. Because anyone can buy an orchid, but getting it to rebloom is the trick. So I have got this to rebloom, uh, which has made me very happy. I've got quite a few paths. Yeah, you know, can be tricky. Once you find the right spot for them though, I think, and find the right watering regime, you, you, you're guaranteed flowers, but I have root rotted one of mine, which was 
very disturbing, but they're pretty reliable, amazing flowers and easy to grow inside. Now I do grow some of the Himalayan Paphia pedlums outside all year and they can cope with my winter minimums. But this one, this one I think wants to stay indoors. So it is in an area that gets a little chilly, as I said, at night in winter, but ultimately it's a much warmer environment. They just like the same conditions as you do. No particular fuss about humidity either. The ambient humidity of the house is perfect for it. Unless you're in somewhere very, very dry with crazy central heating, that might be a problem, but generally it's fine. So there we are, plant lovers. My Paphia pedalum mordii type, which is most likely what it is, is looking absolutely beautiful. I'm thrilled with this flower. And I bought it in bloom just because of that, that green and white. I really have nothing like it, which is why I bought it. And I'm just happy that it's bloomed again. So plant lovers, I hope wherever you are, your paths are treating you well. Look at that, the leaves are just stunning. And I hope that you are gonna subscribe because every Friday I post my videos and you will know exactly when that hits the ether if you press the notification bell. But until then, Mordii and myself are going to wish you a very happy week and looking forward to seeing you all next week.